some time ago, uh, it was actually probably my first, my first dip into the world of digital humanities, was starting to use Zotero a few years ago and creating a translator for the National Archives database. Uh, what a translator does, and we'll talk about more, this more in the, the workshop this afternoon, but what a translator does is it extract, extracts structured information from a web page. So the translator for the National Archives extracts that metadata relating to files and saves it into your research database. Um, with changes to both Record Search and Zotero over the years, uh, the translator has had a few problems. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, fought a, a sort of pitch battle with it this year uh, and finally succeeded in getting it working again. Uh, and this is important, not just for anybody researching National Archives uh, using their database, but specifically for our project, Invisible Australians. Because that, I think, is a really important tool that we can put out there help, that helps people with their own research, but also makes it easy for them to share. Because we can create a Zotero group, as we have, and people can just drop stuff which they think is relevant into that Zotero group, and we can make use of that. Similarly, uh, there's a problem with the National Archives database in that it's really difficult to link to individual items, to documents within the National Archives database. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. So that makes it really difficult to share, really difficult to cite, really difficult to sort of start a conversation around particular documents. Um, I've had various approaches to solving this problem over the years as well. I had a user script uh, which, which uh, started to, to help uh, in terms of the, the way the digital images were represented. But most recently I've developed uh, an archives viewer uh, what the archives viewer does is you feed it uh, a barcode from an item within uh, the National Archives database uh, and a page number, it goes off, it gets the image and it presents it here uh, with all the, the nice metadata about the file which you actually don't get within the National Archives database if you're viewing it, uh, an individual document. And it has, uh, you can't see down the bottom there, but you have a nice persistent URL down there which you can share or cite. So you can actually uh, put this out there, you can start talking about it and developing a conversation around this particular document. Mm -hmm. It's a simple thing, but it's also really, really powerful. Just that ability to share a document and to talk about it. Um, so again, this has uh, many uses beyond Invisible Australians, but within the context of invi Invisible Australians, it really helps us in terms of working with people and, and sharing material. Um, and also, there's a number of other features in the archives viewer. Um, as well as just looking at an individual page. Oh, it's a, a blog post where I talk about developing the archives here. Um, you can actually look at the, the complete contents of a file at once. So it loads all the images of a file and presents them, uh, and you can uh, browse those images, uh, and you can share that URL again. Um, so, and it's, it's also an example there of how uh, visually compelling these documents are with the, the portrait photographs and the handprints. This is all free, it's all online, you can go and use it, anybody can use it. There's also a, a, some connectors which actually connect up the National Archives database to the Archives Viewer, another little user script and a bookmarklet. Uh, it's all documented on the site. It means that if you're in the National Archives database, uh, the, the user script in that case rewrites the link to the digitised file so that it opens here rather than in record search. So the experience becomes quite seamless. Uh, in terms of opportunism, uh, we've had a few, uh, a few developments. Uh, one example is um, that uh, I'm currently working on a project with the uh, Mossman Library, uh, bringing together information about the World War I experience of local people. That uh, has always been conceived of as a linked open data project, uh, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that today. So exposing the data that we collect uh, from that project uh, in um, a variety of uh, machine-readable forms and linking it to other resources uh, which exist out there on the web and using established vocabularies in order to describe it. In order to do that for the Mossman project, I've had to develop uh, a few approaches, uh, relatively lightweight approaches to exposing that linked open data. And I'm not going to go into details here because I'll leave that to Connell and Ingrid. Uh, <laughs> um, but this is an example where uh, um, just, this is just preliminary data where we've got uh, taken names from the local war memorial at Mossman uh, and we've got, I've got it into a database and I've uh, now developed and here's a sort of little bit of geek joy um, in that uh, I have got uh, my 303 redirection 
and my content negotiation working. <laughs> and I was really excited about that. <laughs> um, and again, it's a relatively sort of lightweight uh, approach because uh, we're looking at uh, you know, projects which might not have a lot of resources because we're going to share this code. Um, but you can get it out in a variety of forms. This is Turtle. <laughs> it's a way of representing uh, linked open data. Um, and you can get it in uh, RDF XML and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'll leave the details, but it was really exciting for me when I got this working. Uh, and, and, and in terms of opportunism, taking advantage, I mean, this is work which I'm being paid to do, obviously. The code's going to be out there. I'm going to be one of the first users of this code uh, in terms of applying it to exposing the information that we've got within Invisible Australians. Um, another sort of uh, opportunistic victory is that Kate has been awarded an Ian McLean Award from the National Archives of Australia uh, to um, work on a particular subset of the records, uh, in particular trying to track movements of a, of a group of people from New South Wales. Um, so she gets time off. Uh, she can you know, you know, take some leave from her job because uh, we have to earn some money along the way. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, she can spend some time getting some really nice data, uh, uh, developing some material around this. And of course, I'm the tech support for the project. Um, so uh, I'm quite excited about it because uh, it's my excuse to actually play with, uh, with a tool called Neatline. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about Neatline this afternoon as well. Uh, to put it you know, in a brief form, Neatline is a way of constructing um, geotemporal narratives, stories which incorporate uh, you know, time and space. Um, it's, it's a really nice little project and I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a really detailed play with it. Um, it's also a, a, a test of some of our other principles in terms of the flexibility, um, being able to move our data around. We will have our data in our, 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 our system, but uh, Neatline will, will stand alone um, and we'll be, so we'll be moving data between the two so that we can take advantage of the features that Neatline have for, for presenting that material in a sort of exhibition form um, with, with that uh, geo-temporal uh, overlay. Um, but we'll have links so we'll be able to move the data between the systems. Um, because after all, you know, what we're about is not developing software. You know, that's not the point of the project, nor is it just creating a database. The whole idea of this is to bring this data together, to enrich it in ways that enable people to do new things. Um, to tell really richly contextualised stories. To see patterns and, and to find connections. So. Here we are, a couple of years later. What have we done? <laughs> um, in some ways, it feels like not very much. Um, but, you know, we can afford to be patient. We have no particular deadline. We have the rest of our lives. Um, in other ways, you know, we've been surprisingly successful. <laughs> uh, you know, it, particularly the sort of international recognition which the project has got, which has taken us by surprise. Um, and that, of course, brings with it a much greater awareness of those records and of the wider Australia policy. You know, going around the place, uh, I was in Canada earlier this year talking to people about what the wider Australia policy was and what the records are and what they tell us and getting an amazing reaction. Um, and of course, uh, there, are s there was similar uh, immigration restriction uh, legislation in a number of countries around the world, including Canada and the US and New Zealand. So there's all sorts of possibilities for us, international connections in these sort of projects. Um, but really what I wanted to say in, in, in summing up was that uh, I think our experience emphasises uh, a, a really important aspect of digital technologies uh, and what they provide. And that is that they give us the power to try. They give us the possibility to experiment. Um, you know, we can look at the tools and technologies that other people are developing. And we can just have a play with them. We can see what they can do. We can think about how they relate to our own projects. We can look at the, the digitised material which cultural institutions are putting out there. And we can think about how it's displayed, how we might use it, what ideas it gives us. And of course, we can share our ideas. We can share our ideas really easily with people all around the world. And uh, this is a quote from Bethany Novisky, who's the uh, director of the Scholars Lab at the University of Virginia Library and a leading international digital humanist. She gave a, a keynote at the, uh, um, the Association of Digital Humanities in Japan recently. Um, and I think this quote is, is worth reflecting on. 
She says, free and open sharing in small imperfect increments helps to reinforce what I think is good practice for a digital humanities shop like ours. The framing of big ideas as small, relatively low risk, but very public pilot projects. The potential embarrassment of any failure you encounter is, to my mind, more than offset by the potential benefit of having shared a little idea that may well succeed somewhere else. You know, I think we should be sharing ideas, but not just our nicely polished, finished ideas. We should also be sharing our half-baked ideas, our, 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 um, our beginning experiments, our failures as well, our problems and our challenges. So, you know, we don't have to wait for that perfect moment when the stars align and we have the money and we have the people and we have the time. We can actually, with the technologies that are available, just go out there and make a start and just see what happens. Now, that's not necessarily easy. Um, and there are particular challenges, particularly when, as in our case, it's something where you have a heavy emotional investment in as well, and where it takes over your domestic life as well as your professional life. And there's still the possibility that we will crash and burn. Um, but I'm hoping that even if that happens, that somebody else might be able to pick something up from the wreckage and use it. And that's the point of having things open uh, and accessible. Whenever I give a talk, talk about uh, Invisible Australians, I always uh, include our little motto. It's ridiculously ambitious, totally unfunded, but too important not to try.